This video is part of our autophagy activation series and today we will cover the 10 habits of exercise for longevity. And together, these 10 habits will activate all the possible longevity mechanisms, covering all of your bases. One habit I actually learned from Cristiano Ronaldo. Yes, yes, Cristiano Ronaldo actually pushed me to implement a habit that I knew worked and I didn't implement for a long time. It has nothing to do with ice baths or marrying a supermodel. You'll discover that today. And responding to your request, I will share with you my controversial exercise routine from my 15 years of longevity research and experimentation. You never heard it in other place, guaranteed. And I'm warning you, it sounds obscene, but it's true. Let's exercise to keep your body young, right now. Welcome to the Wellness Messiah podcast. I'm your host. Rimon. Before we can cover the 10 exercise habits for longevity, let's make sure that we understand how exercise works and how it makes us live longer. Exercise is a form of physical, mechanical stress that we apply in our bodies. This type of physical stress can achieve different goals, from weight loss, bodybuilding, performance, and longevity. All of this depends on the type of mechanism that we try to target. And here, longevity is our primary goal. And the major longevity mechanism that exercise activates is autophagy. This happens via using exercise to create hypoxia and muscle damage. In order to create hypoxia and muscle damage, your exercise must be intense. The more intense the exercise is, the lower the oxygen levels you're going to reach. Besides autophagy, another benefit of intense exercise is keeping your body fit despite getting quote-unquote old, despite the passage of time. You see, your body and the DNA see the muscles as an expensive tissue. Those muscles that you have, they burn a lot of calories at rest. Therefore, your body is ready to disintegrate those muscles if there is no active use no proof of requirement. And the intensity of your exercise is truly what convinces the body to preserve the vital muscle mass that you have and prevents muscle loss, also called as sarcopenia, muscle loss with age. This helps you to stay fit. Now, why does fitness matter? This terrific study from 2019 explains exactly that. The study is called Cardiorespiratory Fitness and Mortality in Healthy Men and Women. I'm quoting from the study. Participants included 4,137 self-referred apparently healthy adults who underwent testing to determine baseline CRF. CRF stands for cardiorespiratory fitness, which you and I can simply call fitness levels. So they measured the fitness levels directly. The participants were followed for an average of 25 years for mortality to determine the relationship of CRF, the fitness levels, and mortality outcomes. Before I tell you what they found, this is what I like about this study. The first one is that they created a measurement that looked directly at the fitness levels instead of how much they exercise. So here they separated the end result of the exercise, the fitness, and not simply the amount of exercise they were doing, the frequency. The second thing they did is they measured directly the fitness levels both in men and women, as opposed to other studies that indirectly rely on estimates. So this is the first study I've seen with this measurement. And thirdly, what I like about the study is that they measured all-cause mortality. You see, many studies just measure one disease, especially cardiovascular disease. If you reduce cardiovascular disease, but now you die from cancer, you're still dead. And in my opinion, cancer is actually worse from suffering standpoint. And here, we don't have this problem because they measured all-cause mortality, including all the diseases that can hurt us. Now, what did they find in the study? The first is women with low fitness levels had a higher risk of dying from any cause. So fitness levels in women were directly connected to mortality. They found the same thing both for men and women. And they also found that low fitness men had a threefold greater risk for cardiovascular disease mortality compared with high fitness men. So you want to be fit. Now, the lead researcher, Matthew Harbour, had his conclusion. I'm quoting from him. The overall results suggest that obtaining a moderate level of fitness for one's age and sex is associated with lower risk of early death, meaning longevity. Cardiorespiratory fitness is directly related to integrated function of numerous physiological systems and is widely considered the best reflection of whole body health and function. As a result, if we improve our fitness, we can have some control over how long and how well we will live. Now, this is a highlight conclusion from the researcher. Let me quote, because this is really important for us. 
One of the outcomes of this study tells us that people should exercise with the intention of improving their cardiorespiratory fitness levels. People often believe that exercise and fitness are interchangeable terms, and physicians don't often communicate that well. So my interpretation of what he's saying is that just exercising doesn't mean fitness, which means it doesn't mean longevity as well. So we must exercise with the intention of preserving our fitness or creating fitness. I'm continuing to quote from the researcher. Medical personnel should be encouraging people to move with a purpose, and the key is intensity. So pay attention to what he said. Intensity is the key to creating and preserving our fitness levels, and this fitness level will help us with our longevity. To summarize, intensity in our exercise is the key for activating autophagy and preserving our fitness levels. Both will increase our longevity. Now, let's go to the 10 habits of exercising for longevity. What is intensity? In terms of exercise, intensity is the actual stress that you expose your muscles, your heart, and lungs to. And this is truly what creates hypoxia and muscle damage. Exercise intensity is controlled by three parameters, speed, resistance, and time under stress. For example, if you run, you're training your leg muscles, your heart, and lungs. If you increase your speed, you increase your intensity on those organs. However, if you run at the same pace for more time than usual, to the point that your body struggles, basically you increase your intensity by increasing time under stress without changing your speed. And thirdly, if you run and now you carry a heavy bag in your back, this increases the resistance against the power of gravity. So this increasing your intensity without actually increasing speed or time under stress. To summarize, there are three ways to control our intensity. We can use those three ways with our exercise routine. The first is speed of movement. The second is weight, which is the power of gravity. And third, time under stress how long consecutively our muscles are exposed to this exact resistance, meaning the movement speed or the weight we put and apply in our bodies. So you can apply these three principles to any exercise that you're doing right now to increase the intensity. In addition, there is a place where intensity can backfire. If there is too much intensity, this is not good as well for your longevity. So if intensity is so important to create hypoxia, but also excess intensity can be problematic as well. It means that intensity, the dose of exercise, is critical for activating autophagy. Of course, as I speak about intensity, with anything I'm going to say in this video, it's not personal advice or recommendation. Please consult your doctor about your individual situation. I don't want you to choke yourself to death to activate autophagy. Choking yourself to death won't help you to live longer. Now about increasing the intensity of our exercise routine. You can easily measure this impact of intensity based on how your body responds. Difficulty to breathe normally suggests hypoxia. Does a marathon runner find it hard to breathe after one kilometer? I don't think so. So no hypoxia there. Another indication is high pulse or heart rate. This suggests hypoxia as well. The heart struggles to supply oxygen and remove CO2. And the third indication is difficulty of the muscles to sustain the stress. This suggests hypoxia, but also muscle damage. Of course, intensity is purely subjective. For an Olympic marathon runner, running one kilometer is not intense, and they will hardly activate any hypoxia or autophagy this way. However, for a person who just recovered from a long bedridden illness, one kilometer of walking is way too much and may lead to apoptosis and muscle wasting. So intensity is simply pushing your individual bar a bit higher. There is a different sweet spot for everyone, and every situation is different. You should know that you can't go from no exercise to high intensity training. This way you're going to get injured. Intense training is possible only after you get into a solid shape and you know how to train without getting injured. If you don't actively exercise, find an expert to guide you through getting into shape before you start with high intensity exercise. 
And besides, intense exercise can be dangerous if you have a medical condition. So please consult your doctor before engaging in any intense exercise. The definition of frequency here is how often do we train intensely on a specific muscle or area. It means the resting time between exercising intensely on a specific muscle. For example, training our back muscles once a week and sprinting twice a week in the same week. Simply gives us a frequency of once a week to the back and twice a week for the legs and the heart. We don't need to add these exercising up because they target different muscles. Walking and low intensity activities won't necessarily be counted here into our frequency. But why frequency matters? One of the holy grails of youthfulness preservation is creating the minimum damage that activates longevity pathways. And with exercise, we do that by using the right frequency in our exercise routine. What does it mean practically? It means that we want to exercise intensely to achieve hypoxia and muscle damage, but we want a frequency that is just enough to stimulate repair, meaning activating autophagy, and also just enough to maintain our muscle mass over the years, but not more than absolutely necessary. Therefore, in my opinion, which is also based on my 12 years of personal experimentation with this, is that exercise for longevity should be intense and not frequent. That is to say, if it is not intense enough, then no damage will occur and there will be no sufficient hypoxia. If it's too frequent, it will cause too much damage and it's not good for the preservation of youth either. In other words, what we're trying to achieve here is activating autophagy, but get away with minimal amount of damage. And this way, we're gonna reap all longevity benefits. So we want to find the sweet spot for our bodies. And you wouldn't believe how long between exercises you can go without losing muscle mass. And I will show you later this ridiculous frequency I am using, so you can decide if this frequency is right for your situation. But I think the principle here matters the most and the frequency you can adapt to your individual situation by experimentation. Question, what do you do if you enjoy working out every day or going to the gym every day? First, let's separate the effectiveness of exercise for youthfulness preservation from what makes our ideal lifestyle and what makes us happy. This video is about the effectiveness how you merge that into your ideal lifestyle, that's on you. Having said that, assuming that you do the required minimal exercise to preserve youth, I would not be against doing more of it if it makes me happy. Being happy makes you less wanting to die. So I've heard, if I were to exercise very frequently or going to the gym every day, what I would do is doing the intense exercises infrequently and make sure that all the other exercises I'm doing frequently, I am doing them in medium to low intensity. Pretty much fun and relaxation. This combination will reap all the longevity benefits and you will use your exercise enthusiasm to make you live longer. What I also like about the strategy is that you're not chained to your exercise routine, meaning that you have the freedom to skip everyday exercises with a low to medium intensity. For example, if you go on vacations. Now, how these low intensity activities make you live longer, you may ask? Well, you are about to find out soon. It's quite fascinating. It will be in today's video. But training infrequently doesn't mean inconsistently. You do want to have a consistent training schedule. In fact, it will increase and will not decrease your autophagy response. It is true because we know that if you train your muscle frequently, then we know that autophagy will kick in faster. In contrast, if you were to just starting out with your exercise routine, therefore it will contribute to your longevity. It also suggests that if you exercise, you don't want to stop your routine. You want to maintain this autophagy momentum in your muscles without yo-yoing it, just like with avoiding yo-yo dieting. But I'm sure from what I've seen with my subscribers that that's not your problem. From looking at your comments, I know that you're very consistent with your lifestyle. So keep up the good work. We want you and need you to stay young and healthy. Now, exercising intensely and infrequently is the first key for exercising for longevity, but that's not everything.
What about low intensity activities? What about them? Do they promote our longevity? Is there any value for low intensity activities? Let's look at the study from 2019 who can give us insight into the value of the habit. This study from 2019 is called Potential Effects on Mortality of Replacing Sedentary Time with Short Sedentary Bouts or Physical Activity, a national cohort study. Sedentary time defined as any time a person is sitting down or lying down. For example, lying down includes sleep. Sitting down includes activities, quote-unquote, such as watching TV, working with a laptop, commuting, dining, and playing video games. I'm quoting from the study. So they took 8,000 people, a total of 7,999 participants, provided compliant accelerometer wear. And all the participants were 45 years old or older. And they followed them over a median follow-up of 5.5 years. Now, what did they find in this study? We found that replacing 30 minutes of total sedentary time with 30 minutes of low-intensity activities, LIPA, was significantly associated with 17% lower mortality risk. This is the first point. What can we learn from that? Well, for longevity, moving is better than not doing anything. Being active in everyday life matters too. Walking 10,000 steps, doing low-intensity sports, dancing, scuba diving, moderate jogging, leisurely sports. Light activity is something else entirely, and it has other benefits for our health, but it won't necessarily target autophagy. So this is a different aspect of our exercise routine, and it has nothing to do with high-intensity exercise for autophagy. I want to make this clear. There is a place to be active moderately in most days, and infrequently engage in high-intensity training. In fact, what I have found is that intense exercise keeps the muscles in top shape. So the rest of the time, you want to be more active. Your muscles are itching to move and do something. This is youth, and it comes from healthy, trained muscles. So when you train your muscles, you want to lift things. When you are trained in boxing, you're probably looking for the next brawl. So by no means, don't do high-intensity training and then lie in bed all day. We want to use our fitness levels to move. Both intense exercise and low-intensity activity are valuable for our longevity and health. Question. If you exercise intensely, infrequently, but sit all day and do nothing, is this high-intensity activity is enough to squeeze all the longevity benefits? The answer is no. You'll reap some of the longevity benefits, but not all of them. You see, both high-intensity, infrequent exercise and moderate to low-activity exercise every day have their own benefits that are different layers of longevity benefits. A more interesting question here is this. What will happen to your muscle mass, fitness levels, and your body fat if you sit most days but exercise intensely, infrequently? From my experiments, when I do that on many weeks and I've been sedentary, I've been sitting for many hours every day, Yet I implemented this high-intensity infrequent training, I did notice the following results. According to my measurements, I did not lose muscle mass. However, I did lose some fitness levels, about 10%, especially the endurance part of my exercise. Interestingly enough, I did stay 8% body fat. I stayed lean and fit, but I kept a healthy diet too, which is a big deal here, of course. And of course, I knew all along that I did not receive all the longevity benefits. And it's better for me to do this high-intensity infrequent training plus being active most of the days. My suggestion is this. If you plan to not move most of the time, then at least focus on nutrition during those times, such as avoiding sugar and excessive carbs, which will do more damage if you have a sedentary lifestyle. Increase the intensity of everyday activities. Here, we are still dealing with the everyday activities, not the infrequent, intense exercise I mentioned before. Now, before I'm going to explain the habit, let's look at the study from 2019. Another interesting thing they found in the study, here is the interesting thing that is really relevant to this habit. They found that replacement of the low activity levels with 30 minutes of MVPA, MVPA means moderate to vigorous physical activity, was significantly associated with 35% lower mortality risk. So what does it mean? It means that if you're already moving and you're not sedentary and you move more intensely, 
Now you double the longevity benefits from 17% to 35%. This is terrific. And it makes sense because if exercise is a drug, then the intensity is the dose. And this dose up to a point as we spoke has increasing longevity benefits. It activates autophagy, it burns off blood sugar and reduces the peaks of sugar from our meals. Intensity also improves insulin sensitivity. It reduces insulin resistance. It decreases blood flow to our brain and the entire body. And the intensity even helps to detoxify our bodies by pumping the lymph system. You know, this switch system that we have, and for this system to move, it's completely dependent on the movement of our muscles. There is no other pumps for this switch system. So if we're already moving, if we're already walking, going with a dog to a walk, why not increasing a bit our intensity? It can be excellent both for our longevity and also for our time management because we're going to save a bit of time every day. For a few examples, if you walk from point A to point B, try to make it faster. Walking up the stairs, well, try to climb faster, based on your medical situation, of course. If you go on a swim, try to swim a bit faster. When you do house chores, try to hasten them so you can increase the intensity, without, of course, breaking the dishes. Well, I've done it myself, and all my dishes are practically cracked. Thank you, IKEA. And my conclusion with doing the dishes fast is that even though I increase my longevity, I reduce the longevity of my dishes. Now, another interesting thing they found in the study, I'm quoting from the same study, this is the third finding. There were beneficial associations of replacing total sedentary time with short physical activity bouts on a mortality risk. Now, how long and how often these short bursts of intense exercise lasted? They said between one to five minutes every 30 minutes. And these short bursts were enough to reduce mortality and reap longevity benefits. So what does it mean? It means that short bursts of activity of just a minute or two provided a health benefit. So if you walk from your house to the store, doing it a bit faster, even for one or two minutes, has some benefits. Try to make your low-intensity activities into moderate-intensity activities, especially it's helpful after meals. And it's very difficult to be too intense in those situations. So I don't see any risk here besides breaking the dishes. The bottom line is this. Both intense exercise and low-intensity activity are valuable for our longevity and health. And they are both can be used for unlike strategy. This strategy for using exercise for longevity has nothing to do with what we have covered so far with autophagy, but it has everything to do with exercising for longevity. What is blood sugar? You have 5 liters of blood in your body. In that blood you have many nutrients. One of them is sugar or glucose. The body is using it to maintain a minimal function of various systems. The body has to maintain this minimal baseline levels, otherwise it cannot function, it will die. You will die. How much sugar do you think you have in your entire blood? Most people, most healthy people, undiabetic people, have about one teaspoon of sugar. That's it. This is, by the way, the result that you see in your blood tests. Now, this blood sugar is also called blood glucose. So, on the one side, we need this baseline level of blood sugar. On the other hand, we can increase blood sugar beyond this baseline. And this increase isn't good for your health or your longevity. So, now you understand the two levels of blood sugar. And the term that you need to remember is sugar spike or glucose spike. Glucose spike refers to the increase of sugar beyond the baseline, the secondary level of sugar. I hope this understood now. Now you may ask, when do our sugar levels spike? And what can we do about it to live longer? There are two main ways in which the body increases sugar in level beyond the baseline levels. The first major way is when we eat sugar and carbs. Carbs are trees of glucose, that exact sugar. And when you eat food with carbs and sugar, you're going to have an increase in this blood sugar beyond the baseline level. So this level of sugar entering into the blood from the food that we are eating is going to add on top of the baseline sugar levels that we spoke before. The second way in which blood sugar goes up above this baseline levels is when the body, specifically the liver, manufactures it out of protein. Yes, the body can create sugar out of protein. It's a very simple process. It's called gluconeogenesis. 
Now, when does the body convert protein into sugar? The first time is when you eat protein. Every time you eat protein, some of it is going to end up with sugar. That's how the liver works. The second time the body manufactures glucose, sugar, is when you're stressed. When I take blood tests, whenever I'm stressed, I always see my blood sugars up about 20 to 30 percent, as if I ate sugar or protein. Yet, I ate nothing. This is one of the reasons why chronic stress is so bad for you. It's almost like eating sugar. And this increase of sugar, this sugar spike above the baseline level, is associated with increased aging and shorter life. Let me show you studies on that by one of the most famous research organizations in our longevity community, the Intervention Testing Program, and also the interpretation of the studies by the head of the ITP, Dr. Richard Miller. In this study I'm about to show you, they gave mice caniglifizin, a diabetic drug. This drug doesn't prevent glucose sugar from being absorbed from the meal, but it does prevent this very rapid increase in blood sugar levels. Let's go into the study and see what they found. Caniglifizin extends lifespan in genetically heterogeneous male but not female mice. Cana, this drug, extending median survival of male mice by 14% with parallel effects seen at each of the three test sites. This means that this intervention testing program, they replicate the same study in three different locations. In every location, reducing those sugar spikes increased significantly the maximum lifespan. So this drug in male mice leads to about 14% increase in lifespan. And Dr. Richard Miller, the head of the ITP, stated that, I'm quoting, this drug that prevents sugar spikes puts off at least five different kinds of diseases in mice. It's authentically an anti-aging drug. And it's the second of the anti-aging drugs in mice that works apparently by blocking the highest glucose levels during the day. Pay attention that he said that it's not a special characteristic to this specific drug. If you reduce the sugar spike, you're going to achieve the same result. And I say you don't need to take caliglifosin, you can do it by exercising or at least being active after meals. And this was going to flatten the highest blood sugar level of the day. Let's get practical here. How can we use exercise to reduce those blood sugar spikes and increase our longevity? There are two habits that we can extract out of this principle of lowering the highest blood sugar of the day. Let's hear now from Dr. Ron Rosedale, a founder of the Colorado Center for Metabolic Medicine and a world's expert on sugar and aging. In this interview, Dr. Rosedale spoke about his recommendation on the exact timing of using exercise for controlling blood sugar spikes. I'm quoting from him, the best morning after pill for mistakes in diet is exercise. If you're going to eat something that is going to raise your blood sugar, one of the major benefits of exercise is that it allows you to burn off that sugar and doesn't leave it around as long to do damage. The best time to exercise, if you splurge on something that you know you should not have, is immediately afterwards. Your blood sugar will rise immediately after you eat. Let's say that you ate potato and that's going to cause your blood sugar to go up. You're better off to burn off that sugar that the potato is going to turn into than to leave that sugar around to glycate and raise your insulin and cause insulin resistance. Dr. Ron Rosedale referred to potato as a potential to become sugar because potato is simply a tree of many glucose molecules. And this is true to all high carb foods, pasta, bread, cereal, anything really that comes from grains. Dr. Ron Rosedale did not mention sweets. But you already know that eating sweets and desserts will increase your blood sugar. It has sugar inside. Therefore, I call this habit exercise after sweets and carbs. Practically, it means when you eat sugar, sweets, or high-carb meals, then try to move after. Be physically active. And ideally, not too long after the meal, after the dessert. A good timing is somewhere around 5 to 30 minutes after the meal. What I also like about this habit is that it stops binging. I used to be addicted to sugar and sweets and carbs, and when I started eating sugar, I simply could not stop eating it. But I noticed that as I implemented this habit, as I exercised for a few minutes, immediately the binging impulse stopped. So if you're like me, and you binge on sweets and find it difficult to stop, exercising after sweets, after eating sweets, stops the binging roller coaster. 
and honestly, the shame that comes with it. Notes about this habit. 1. The activity doesn't have to be high-intensity exercise. Any physical activity, any physical movement is good, but it needs to be soon after eating sweets and carbs. 2. The more intense the movement, the faster you'll burn blood sugar and bring it down. So if you add a lot of sugar and a lot of carbs, intense exercise is going to reduce the spike faster. 3. The amount of sugar that you ate matters too. If you ate a lot of sugar and carbs, then you want to exercise and move for a longer time because you need more activity to burn more sugar. And four, you can plan your pleasure meal and desserts immediately before exercising. Today, finally, I avoid sweets. But back in the day, I used to plan my pleasure foods right before exercise. Exercise I had to do anyway. And I also put sweets immediately before walks out of the house that I needed to do anyway. Practically, you can save the pleasure foods for times that you know you're going to exercise immediately after. So this is the beginner's habit out of this principle. If you're like me, eventually you will manage to control your sweets eating and carbs. You manage to overcome the cravings, then you're ready for the next level. Every meal will raise a bit your blood sugar. And for longevity, we want to reduce any unnecessarily increase in blood sugar. Here comes the more advanced habit. Eat to exercise. This strategy you can copy from Cristiano Ronaldo, really. And I believe this strategy is one of the reasons and is partially responsible for his career longevity. Let's hear his teammate explains how Cristiano Ronaldo lifestyle looks with eating and exercise. But you once went for lunch with him at Manchester United. I think you were going to have a gentle lunch and it turned out to be a very competitive afternoon. He said, let's go and having a lunch after training. Go to his house. I look at it. It was just some salad, plain white chicken, no juice, just water. So we have a food, quickly a lunch. And after that, he said, let's go in the garden and play two touch. I said, Christian, we just finished. So we go playing two touch. After that, let's go for a swim. <laughs> after that, let's have a sauna, jacuzzi. I was like, Cristiano, why you di we didn't stay at the training room? <laughs> yeah. So that's why I said, Cristiano deserve everything. Yeah. That's funny. This guy is known to eat meals to give him energy to exercise almost immediately after. So in essence, he actually eats to exercise. Now let's expand on the name of the strategy. Most people, including myself, use meals as a motivation to exercise. It's much more motivating to do intense exercise knowing that a nice meal is waiting for us after. And for most of my life, I did exactly that. Push myself to the limit with my workout, followed by rest and digest. I exercised to eat. However, those large meals create the highest blood sugar of the day. I measure that myself, and even when I eat protein, no carbs or sugar in the meal, some of that protein will become blood sugar. Our liver converts some protein into sugar, and we want to reduce that. Now, why is that important? Because we know that reducing those sugar spikes after meals increases longevity. Learn from Cristiano Ronaldo. Keep certain workouts, not necessarily all of them, after large meals. That includes also house chores. So we can use both high intensity and low intensity exercises after meals. So to summarize, eat to exercise instead of exercise to eat. This will squeeze more longevity benefits from your routine. What's the difference between this advanced habit to the previous habit? Well, in the previous habit, we assume that you will eat sweets and carbs from time to time. With this one, you can implement it after any meal with protein. Second, this strategy suggests a more intense exercise and truly intentional timing as part of our exercise routine. In other words, we plan some of our workouts to be exactly after meals, by design. This habit, believe it or not, I managed to implement only in the last two years. So today, what I do, I plan certain workouts that are part of my exercise plan, exercise routine, immediately after the largest meals of the week. I've heard criticisms about bringing up this habit. Criticisms such as it's dangerous to exercise after meals because, you know, the gut and the muscles will compete for blood and nutrients. 
Well, I've been doing this habit for the last two years and I feel fine, and so is Cristiano Ronaldo. Some clarification though about this habit. This should be obvious. If besides protein you also ate carbs in the meal, this meal would be the best time, the best timing to add exercise immediately after. It would be better to do that over a non-carb meal. Another note that I don't feel the need to exercise after eating vegetables or oils, such as salad with olive oil. Instead, I keep my exercises and workouts for the largest meals of the day. Those that have a lot of protein. Because remember, the body is going to convert some of this protein into sugar. And it's going to increase our blood sugar. It's going to cause a blood sugar spike. The third note is that you don't need to do many exercises to achieve the purpose. Even one workout for 5 to 10 minutes will help a lot to flatten the sugar curve. Reduce self-judgment. I found that just being aware of the value of this habit helps a lot. What you'll discover that over time, simply knowing intellectually the value of this habit, you'll naturally be inclined to apply it. Remember, it took me 12 years to transition from beginners, meaning to burn sugar after sweets, into eat to exercise habit. Now, you don't have to do this with every meal, but it's really important after high carb meal or a large meal. And the last note is that you don't need to plan all of your workouts this way. Personally, I don't do it with every exercise. If the exercise is too intense and it requires a lot of concentration and focus, I much rather do it on empty stomach where I can concentrate. I like to use workouts as a meditation to reduce stress. And it works better for me if I do them on empty stomach. So it depends on the type of workout. As you can see, the habit is pretty flexible. The habit requires some experimentation and seeing how you feel. Maybe you are too tired to move after a meal. So don't be too tough on yourself and try to integrate it to your lifestyle based on your comfort level. And the most important thing to remember here is this. If Cristiano Ronaldo invites you to a lunch, don't go. Let's move on with the habits. And all the other habits I'm going to mention, they all refer to the intense exercise that is infrequent in our exercise routine, not the everyday activities. So let's move on. One of the common mistakes in our longevity community is assuming that autophagy is a global phenomenon. It is not. Now, the study I mentioned from 2015 speaks about that. I'm quoting, in conclusion, autophagy seems to be necessary for adaptation by providing locally the condition for muscle plasticity and apoptosis systematically by mobilizing progenitor cells. So autophagy happens locally within the specific muscles. What does it mean? When you train a certain muscle, you increase autophagy within this muscle. And if you train intensely enough, you also activate autophagy in the heart and in the cardiovascular system, both of which are exposed to the same stress coming from the muscle. But this is where it stops. If autophagy is somehow activated in other organs, it happens to a much lower degree because the organ itself isn't exposed to this intense damage in hypoxia that the muscles that you're targeting and exercising on is exposed to. Exercise won't induce autophagy throughout the entire body. Not all the organs and all the muscles in your body are going to stay young if you only focus on single muscles. It means that training your legs won't create autophagy in your back muscles. It means that if the only thing that you do is running, you will keep those leg muscles and the heart young, but not the rest of the muscles or the organs. And you know, it makes sense. You already know that if you train your biceps, your back muscles are not going to grow. So why would it be any different with autophagy activation? If you want to stay young and live longer, you want to keep all your muscles young, not just one of them. Now, which is better for achieving autophagy? Resistance exercise, such as lifting weights, or aerobic exercise like running and jogging? Both high-intensity aerobic and resistance training activate autophagy because they both can create hypoxia and muscle damage. And a very little known fact 
is that every resistance exercise, every weightlifting actually is a cardiovascular exercise because every time that you challenge your muscles with weights, it's also going to increase your heart rate. However, every resistance exercise is not a lung exercise. It's a heart exercise, but not lung, what is called pulmonary, as opposed to aerobic exercise that is both cardiovascular and lung. So it's pulmonary cardiovascular activity. The bottom line is that also resistance exercise activates autophagy in the heart when it's done intensely. Another benefit of aerobics over resistance training is that it exposes the heart to a different type of stress, prolonged stress. Let's say that you run for 10 minutes with the intensity going up gradually. You'll see your pulse, your heart rate going up as well in this gradual way in staying up for 10 minutes. This is a unique type of stress on the heart, which I think is complementary. In addition, this high pulse doubles or even triples the amount of blood that your brain receives for those 10 minutes, nourishing the brain faster and allows the brain more time for dumping toxins into the blood. Therefore, intense aerobics provide a unique value to the lung, the heart, and the brain. Very important organs. The conclusion is that ideally we want to integrate both resistance training and aerobics exercise in the right intensity. And together, they will cover every aspect of longevity benefits from exercise by activating autophagy and preserving our fitness levels in a complementary way. So both of these are very important for preserving our youthfulness. We spoke about how intensity activates autophagy and how we need to use high intensity training, possibly interval training, but infrequently. So far, so good. The problem is with over exercising. Over exercising, meaning exercising too hard, too intensely, without a proper rest and recovery nutrients, will overtax the repair system. When we over exercise, we hurt the ability of our repair system to do its job. Instead of activating autophagy, it could lead to the death of muscle cells and this could lead to muscle wasting. How do I know that the exercise I've been doing, the high intensity exercise I've been doing, was intense enough, but not too intense? Is having muscle soreness, what is called DOMS, after the exercise when your muscles, they ache a bit. If you have it one day after the exercise, but not after one day, it suggests small amount of damage, which is good. So that could be a good indication you used a very good intensity. You don't have to feel this muscle soreness, but I, my rule of thumb is one day is, is okay. Having more than one day, at this point, I'm transitioning into a large muscle damage which could promote muscle growth if I'm going to eat high protein diet. But this is not pro longevity. This is not preservation, it's more like for growth. So my rule of thumb is maximum amount of one day of muscle soreness. And this rule of thumb came from many years of tracking my body weight. And I noticed that when I achieve more than one day, then I have to eat high protein diet to recover from this exercise. Otherwise, I'm going to lose muscle mass. I'm going to uh, achieve apoptosis. This is not good. So I'm not telling you this based on my ideology, simply based on my experimentation and measurements with my body. And when I wanted to build muscle mass, usually have muscle soreness for five, sometimes six days. So if you have trained very hard on your legs, you know that the legs could have a painful impact for four, three, five days. So this suggests not necessarily the right intensity, but too much intensity, which has a proclivity to increase muscle mass if you're going to eat excess protein. But in the everyday use that you want to preserve your muscle mass, it's unnecessary. As a longevitist who cares about your lifelong health, you have a privilege. Bodybuilders, Olympic athletes, and professional sports athletes don't have this privilege. They all need to improve every day. They have to achieve gains every day. They have to push their body as hard as possible, but you don't have to. So you have the privilege of focusing on nourishing and supporting this recovery and repair system. And you do that by avoiding overtraining, but also by providing rest and nutrients. Besides avoiding overtaxing the repair system, you can support its activity, its natural activity. You can do that by increasing your sleep quality after the exercise. For example, we know professional athletes who sleep better have fewer injuries. 
fewer injuries indicate an active repair system and it also indicates less accumulated damage. And for you, it means more longevity. Let me quote from Dr. Christopher Winter, a medical doctor and a sleep researcher. He said, we exercise for a purpose, for cardiovascular health, to increase lean muscle mass, to improve endurance and more. All these goals require sleep. Without sleep, exercise does not deliver those benefits. If you don't sleep, you undermine your body. In addition, you can also use a proper nutrition. This will allow the repair system to use the nutrients to repair the damage and use that to increase the longevity of your entire body. The point here is this. You can squeeze more longevity benefits from your exercise by incorporating deep sleep and healthy nutritional habits. So if your friend and you are doing the exact same exercise, you are going to extract way more longevity benefits and more health benefits for the same amount of effort, the same workout, simply by improving your sleep quality and increasing the nourishment of your body. To what degree do quality sleep and healthy nutrition help to reap the exercise benefits? Let me give you specific numbers here, in my opinion. Because exercise is just a stimulus, I estimate that there is a synergetic effect between exercise for longevity, sleep, and nutrition, which doubles or even triples the benefit. You see, exercise provides the stimulus, then sleep and nutrition, they provide the response to the stimulus. This better and faster response results in activating autophagy faster and deeper, plus better fitness levels, less injuries, and reducing the average sugar levels, all of which contributes to your longevity. So double or triple your exercise benefits right now by integrating it with high quality nutrition and high quality sleep. I have a specific guide in this channel on how to improve your sleep quality. Now let's move to what I do with my exercise routine. You never heard it in other place, guaranteed. And I'm warning you, it sounds obscene, but it's true. The first thing that I do is making sure that I eat a healthy diet. This will bring more benefits from my exercise and also I know that it's gonna kick in autophagy faster from my exercise. So yes, healthy diet does so. So that's the context, but what about my exercise routine? This is going to sound ridiculous, obscene, a lie, but it is the truth. In my early 20s, I used to exercise four to five times a week. I used to be an exercise enthusiast and it took me four years of researching longevity to understand truly that it may not be necessary. My major goal with my exercise was to keep my muscle mass. And ask myself, what's the minimal amount of exercise that I can do to still preserve the same strength and muscle mass? As I researched this and experimented with it, I found a study, and it was in 2011, that gave me a hint that it takes about 14 days before muscles begin to waste. So I gave it a go and began to measure. I started my once every two weeks high intensity exercise routine. And what do you know, as I tracked my body, I noticed that I lift the same weights and I had the same muscle mass. Then I thought I was a smart ass. I tried to push it further. And once I passed the 14 day mark, I lost muscle mass. Those discoveries were painful because to build muscle mass, I need a completely different exercise program. You see, this protocol only works for maintenance, not for muscle growth. Make sense? And indeed, since 2011, almost 12 years now, I exercise once every two weeks per muscle. I don't exercise all of them in one session, but I divide them. But here is the highlight. I actually go to the gym just once every two weeks. And I leave some workouts for my home. Can you guess why? The second strategy we talk about today, eat to exercise. And today, some of the high intensity exercises that I do at home, I do after meals. Or well, at least I do some physical activity or movement, such as walking, to flatten the sugar level curve. How many exercises am I doing? For important muscles, I do incorporate two types of exercises. For example, I'm doing two types of back exercises that stress the muscles in a bit different ways. And I can do both of them at the same session, 
or I can divide them. Anyhow, I do them once every two weeks. I only choose exercises that imitate everyday activities. I want these exercises to be as functional, as practical as possible. This is the actual paper I'm using as a day documentation. I need to know when was the last time I exercised, otherwise I forget the date. On the right is the type of exercise in Hebrew. English, as you may have noticed, isn't my mother tongue, although I doubt that native Hebrew speakers can understand my handwriting. And today, and that could change, I have about 11 to 12 exercises in total that I do each once every two weeks. This includes the aerobics aspect of it, which is not easy for me because I'm injured. With my aerobics, I'm doing high intensity interval training and I'm using the recumbent stationary bike. About 15 years ago, I got injured. And because of that, I can't really run. That would be my ideal exercise for now. So what I'm doing, I'm using the recliner bicycle. And what I like about the reclining bicycle, it doesn't apply a lot of pressure on my joints, which means that I can continue with this exercise for my entire life. Because, you know, there is some notion that after age 40 or 50, you don't want to run because the recovery rate of your joints is going down. So that's what I do. It also uh, activates my large muscles in the legs. And it also increases my heartbeat. So that's what I do personally. Now, how do I truly know it is working for me? So there are three things I'm tracking. The first, I track the weights that I can lift and my running speed. If I lift the same weights, it means that I preserve my physical strength. Now regarding speed, and this is super important for longevity. If you follow sports in whatever sports that you love, you know that athletes lose speed from the age of 24, from 24, and it doesn't matter how hard they train afterwards. It happens because our muscle tissue is the fastest aging tissue in our bodies, and muscle speed is a very good indication of muscle aging. Based on muscle speed, my muscles are still young. When I sprint, even though I can get injured, I sprint very fast. The second indication is lean body mass. I track my lean body mass and it doesn't change, as I explained. It only changed when I cheat in my intensity or when I go over 14 days. And my third parameter is body fat percentage. I track my body fat every month over the last 12 years. And I know that this weird protocol works because I still have the same 8% body fat exactly when I was 23. And today I'm 35. And I could not have this 8% body fat unless my exercise routine was working and my muscle mass stayed consistent. And I'm sure there are going to be exercise experts that will say that everything I do is wrong. It could be. But listen, I care about longevity. If I can activate autophagy intensely in every muscle in our body every two weeks and I can keep my muscle mass, strength and speed, for me, this is the minimum amount of damage for maximum longevity. And what I also like about this strategy is that it saves me a bunch of time. The biggest challenge I found with implementing this strategy is the mental challenge, continuing with high intensity without cheating once every two weeks for every muscle. Because it's very easy to do lower intensity, which is easier especially that you don't do the exercise every day. Sometimes we forget how to use the muscle. So what I found is I need to do some warm up to remind myself after two weeks how to do the exercise properly without cheating with proper form. This is very important. This is my body, not yours. And you need to track your body too and consult your doctor about the intensity. And my routine may not work for you. You know, maybe when I hit 50, it will stop working for me and I will need more frequency. Who knows? And besides, you may not be as lazy as I with my exercise routine. Do you want more information about my exercise routine? Then I published two years ago a podcast. It was about 40 minute podcast episode that expands on my individual exercise every two weeks routine. And I'm going to put a link for that in the description. Now, let's recap everything that we have learned today and make it easy to remember. We want to exercise for longevity. We want to exercise for youthfulness preservation. And for that, our goal is to use exercise to activate three tactical goals. 
to activate autophagy, to preserve our fitness levels, and to reduce the highest blood sugar of the day. These are going to achieve the maximum longevity and youthfulness preservation benefits according to the latest science. Now let's organize the habits we learned today into two categories, habits relating to intense exercise that we do infrequently and habits that we do every day in everyday activities. These habits we covered today are related to our intense exercise routine. One, increase your exercise intensity, but not too much. Two, reduce your frequency. Three, exercise all key muscles at least once every two weeks and include both aerobics and resistant training. Stay consistent with your exercise routine despite being infrequent. 5. Keep certain workouts after large meals or sweets. 6. Avoid overtraining, meaning too much intensity or too frequently. I gave you the rule of thumb I found on my body is that your muscles aren't sore for more than one day. If they hurt more, they are open for muscle growth, not youthfulness preservation. 7. Improve your sleep and nutrition to double or triple the benefits of your high-intensity exercise routine. These habits relate to the everyday activities. 1. Use your fitness levels to be active most days. 2. When you can, increase the intensity of these everyday activities. Even short bouts increase health, which leads to the next habit. Consider short bursts of 1-5 to five minutes of exercise after long sitting sessions. 4. Try to do something physical after eating large meals or eating sweets, even if it's a low or medium intensity activity. Now, do a screenshot, print, and hang on the wall or in the office. Share. I know these are 11 habits, not 10 like I promise. Well, this channel is trying to over deliver. So if you like what you heard today, please consider subscribing to this channel and possibly join you the dozens of people who are members via Patreon. And I thank all of you. You'll give me the energy boost that I need. When you join, you'll receive bonuses such as ads free videos, Q&A forum about longevity, ask any question you want, my complete supplement routine for longevity, and you'll affect which videos should I produce next. Of course, you will also support my wife's stroke situation. Check the Patreon link in the description. Now, let's go to the big picture of longevity. Now, the last section of today. Let's see the big picture because exercise is not everything in longevity, so we need to see how exercise fits to our entire longevity strategy. This leads me to the 10 commandments of longevity. And I like to be playful, so I call them the 10 longevity commandments to play on the name of the channel, the Wellness Messiah. God did not give me those commandments, if you wonder. Although we speak from time to time, yet I find that we have a very few shared interests. Apparently, God is not very keen on longevity. What immortality can do to you? Seriously, let's see if you can pick two of those two exercise strategies out of the Ten Commandments of Longevity. And after that, I'm going to put a link at the end screen of this video, both to my podcast about my exercise routine and also about the episode when it's out about fasting for autophagy. So you can activate autophagy both with exercise and fasting. So don't go anywhere.